So today we will be covering lecture three, operating system overview, Windows and Linux. In this lecture, we'll be covering this contents. What is Windows operating system in introduction, the discovering the history of the architecture of Windows operating system, Windows, we'll compare Windows to other operating system. And then we'll study about Linux. We'll talk about the components of Linux, kernel mode, user mode, basic features and architecture of the both operating system. So in Windows operating system, we actually have been using this for the last 40 years. We started using Windows operating system from 1981. Up to this, we have started from Windows DOS. And from now we use Windows 10. Using Windows, we can actually troubleshoot different problems. We can work with graphical user interface, the common prompt and the PowerShell interfaces. And all of these interfaces actually helps the user, whether the user is a normal user or he is an administration so to conduct different tasks now we will see that what is a graphical user interface what is the command prompt and as a windows powershell and the difference between them now as you can see in the screen this is a graphical user interface all of you are familiar with the interface of the windows 10 windows and this is a interface for the mac okay and then we have this is the interface for windows 10 and we we had windows xp before that we had windows 7 so they also this is the interface of windows 7 now from win, uh, windows graphical user interface we have this common prompt okay where you actually have to write everything i'm not sure whether the picture is clear let me zoom on so here as you can see the problem is that you have to actually write everything all the commands so this is actually called more like character based user interface and then we have the powershell which actually looks a little bit blue and we, you can actually automate different process using the PowerShell. Now, as you can see that even though the graphical user interface is colorful and we have the buttons, we have different templates, different icons, different designs, okay. But in common prompt and in PowerShell, we actually have no design or no icons no logos we have to actually type everything so then what is the difference between this two common prompt and powershell only thing that looks different is the color but apart from the color so there are some more basic differences number one so let's go through this chart as you can see so in the powershell it is actually task oriented command line interface and scripting environment and in common prompt it is the basic command line interpreter for microsoft windows operating system and then in PowerShell, we let's watch a video, then we'll understand the details. So I will, here. Yeah. So let's what you have to say. The difference between common prompt, PowerShell and Bash. So Bash is also a shell which you are actually not familiar still. So this is actually covered in Unix course, but in here we don't actually, most of you haven't done the Unix course. So let's just focus on common prompt and PowerShell. What is the difference between CMD, PowerShell and Bash? Just to clarify once more, when you're using the command line on any computer and you're typing in commands and seeing that text being displayed to you on screen, that's the terminal application. And the terminal application is sending your keystrokes to a, a shell generally. Uh, and the shell is responsible for understanding your keystrokes and executing the commands you're requesting. On Linux and Mac, one of the most popular shells available is Bash. Uh, there are other shells like ZSH and Fish as well, but predominantly it's Bash these days. And Bash allows you to type in commands uh, and execute those commands and then see the results being displayed on screen. And it also allows you to take information from one application and pipe it or pass it into the next application, pipe it into the next application and so on. That information is passed as text and it allows you to take the output of one application and pipe it into the next. In Windows, we have the CMD shell, which many people still think today is MS-DOS. It isn't actually MS-DOS, but it was originally built to be compatible with MS-DOS. So it, it, it supports many of the same commands and much of the same syntax. In CMD, you can also execute commands. You can also pass information from one command to the next, and that information is passed as text. However, CMD is relatively limited in today's world. Uh, so we introduced a new technology back in 20, 2005, something along those lines, called PowerShell. Uh, 
And PowerShell is a whole new approach to uh, command line shell technology. It essentially still provides you a command line syntax and scripting syntax that you can type commands into, but it takes the information that you can pass from one application to the next and passes it as rich objects that you can query and manipulate far more easily than you can process text. PowerShell is now available on Mac and Linux as well and is becoming very broadly adopted. So from the description in the video, we can understand that in common prompt, we can actually only pass text from one application to another application. But PowerShell, we can actually pass on rich objects that can be a customized object or it can be other objects that is more have can have more data and variation of data than the text. So that is the one important difference between PowerShell and Common Prompt. But there's another point that you need to know that in PowerShell, it was here somewhere, is more advanced version of CMD used to run external programs like ping or copy or automate many different system administration tasks which are not accessible from CMD. So this line, the PowerShell can automate many different system administration tasks which are not accessible from Common Prompt. So basically, common from there are many tasks that is you cannot actually do in Common Prompt that can be done in PowerShell. Secondly, here we have another difference if you see that it uses much more powerful functions called CMD lets and here we use mainly string based and older batch languages standard set of functions and then the output uh, it can interpret both batch commands and Hello, PowerShell commands. so as i was saying that it can interpret both batch and batch commands and powershell commands and it can only interpret batch commands so this is the differences between powershell and common prompt and now what is the summary both powershell and common prompt are task-based common line tools Okay, and you we use them rapidly to automate administrative tasks, but <coughs> in terms of functionality and usability, there is significant difference. CMD's basic command line shell introduced with, with Windows NT family. We'll talk about what is Windows Windows NT family very soon. And in PowerShell, on the other hand, is a task-based command line shell, scripted language based on .NET framework used to automate batch processing and create system management tools. So many of you might have already heard about the .NET framework. It's actually a very buzzword. So this is the basic difference between these two. So now we know the difference between graphical user interface, common prompt and Windows PowerShell interface. Now, this is the history of the Windows. As you can see, Windows started from 1981 up till, and now to, to today is 2020. So from 1981, Okay, we started with MS-DOS, okay, the DOS operating system. So initially, as it was 1981, the computers had, a, we can understand the computer has very basic graphics and low memory measured in kilobytes and small drives with few kilobytes or megabytes of storage. So that means the computers we had, had small memory, very low graphics, and at the same time had uh, megabytes of memory and kilobytes of main memory or let's say kilobytes of RAM. And from that, we, ha we have gradually developed to, we have increased the size of the memory. We have increased the size of the storage. Okay, we have increased the graphical interface. So from this, okay, step by step in all of these cases, let's see what happened. Okay, so, and you will see that if we focus on the graphical user interface, first one, we had basic graphics, then we had advanced peripherals and graphics. And then we had uh, increased amount of graphics. There's a new concept called 32 bit computing. So today we will also see what is 32 bit computing, what is 64 bit computing. And let's first focus on the graphics. Okay, so I will now show you what, what the graphics of Windows DOS used to look like. So Windows DOS had graphics similar to this. I can, I, you can see the screen, I guess. So this is actually a graphics of Windows DOS. But as you can see, the My Computer button, the Recycle Bin, they were still there, but the graphics was actually not that much improved. There, there are different tasks that you could actually do. Okay, and it was actually a, nowadays, if you actually compare with the current graphical user interface that we have, it actually looks very old. But if you compare it with only common-based inter, uh, com common-based or 
character based interface this is actually a huge improvement okay and if you have watched a movie uh, there are some movies that did it uh, depending with steve jobs i forgot the name but steve jobs was there and there you can actually see that the how microsoft actually first developed this interfaces okay and what effect it had on the market so you can see the, there are some lot of samples that will give you the idea of dos and the resolution of dos here is another picture you see this is actually a, a bar or i'm not sure whether it's, it is so anyway you can get the idea okay so this is a building where the graphics is like this and it was actually very uh, people are actually sir. It was yeah, a this, game is, this is a game DOS. that I know, but what is representing, I'm not sure. So anyway, it's actually made a lot of buzz. People are actually very excited because this is the first time you could see something on a computer screen, okay, which is actually better than nothing. And then after DOS, we had Windows 3.1. Okay, so you see, this is the graphics of Windows 3.1, which looks almost similar to DOS, but it still is actually a little bit better. If you look closely, you see, let's open a graphics, and you can compare it better so the <coughs> so the last picture that you have seen and this one you will see that this is actually a little bit more improvement from the last one here is another one you see the logos are now a bit more a uh, bit more controlled and shaped and this is actually you can also use the ms dos prompt so this was the windows 3.1 and after windows 3.1 we had windows 95 so this uh, whenever you turned on a computer that had windows 95 first you had use saw that this one okay this logo and after that let's go to the in between so you see the this is actually dos not windows 95 here this is windows 95 so I, wait why is showing dos so let me so, so you see these are the windows 95 uh, different graphical user interfaces so as you can clearly see now the graphics actually look much more better than the windows uh, 3.1 and the dos and after windows 95 let's go back to this we had windows 2000 which actually becomes much more cooler okay as you can see there are the icons have developed a lot and there are a lot of work put in behind the graphics and people are actually in around 2000 a lot of people are actually buying the personal computer so it was very important. So everything was designed in a way so that no, people who are actually not from technical background, who are using computer for official purpose or home use, they are actually feel comfortable and they can actually easily navigate through the interfaces. So there was a lot of work that was put into it. And as you can see the improvement, we can actually see then there was different options like drag and drop. And if you now right click, you will have options like copy, paste, rename, so all these were actually introduced step by step in those windowses. There are different effect system, screen saver. Those were also introduced here. So this was about Windows 2000. And after that, Windows 2000, we had Windows XP, which actually, uh, I'm not sure whether you, any of you have used Windows XP, but I have personally, because yes, sir, we have Windows XP it. was actually very popular and whenever uh, we had an option like whether you want to use windows 2000 and windows xp and we we're like yeah windows x 2000 is actually for old people or it is for actually not cool so everyone whenever someone had windows xp he actually acted like a cool person like yeah in my computer i have windows xp okay but nowadays you see if you compare this windows xp with windows 10 okay and how no one will use it but it's it just 15 years back, whoever had this Windows X, Windows XP, they were actually used to feel a lot better. Okay. And also after that, so this is, these were the interface of Windows XP. As you can see, the icons were much, a lot better. Okay. The color composition was very good and there are different features that you could use. <coughs> it is, <coughs> and the, the different, uh, where is it? Okay. I lost the picture. So here we had another version of Windows XP, uh, let's call it a remastered. So this was actually better than Windows XP in terms of visualization graphics. So as you can see in Windows Vista, we called it Windows Vista. It was basically a customization themes. It had a lot of customized themes. Uh, even, you know, you can use it nowadays as well. Let me show you these pictures. So.
that it's almost like Windows 7. Yes, it's actually very cool, right? So Windows Vista was actually a lot better improvement and it's, 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 it was nice to see. And there are a lot of people, if you like, if you want to use it, you can use it as well. This actually looks very nice. Okay, not that bad. And here, there are some customization was done as well to make sure it looked like, look, okay, here. So this almost looked like Windows 7, if you can see. And Windows 7 actually came from 2009 and it was actually very sudden. Suddenly Microsoft, uh, around 2006 and 2008 people was expecting like after windows vista they will come out like vista 2 or something else and then suddenly windows company actually uh, microsoft actually proposed that there's a new windows coming that it will be windows 7 and everyone was very excited okay, i still remember at the time like we were waiting when the windows 7 will come so that we can actually install that windows 7 so initially when windows 7 came it was actually huge improvement not only in terms of graphical user interface in terms of speed in terms of not only in terms of speed okay in terms of functionalities there are so many things you could do using windows 7 and that people is still use windows 7 in different offices okay and many people still use it as a personal for their own personal computer so why windows 7 was actually so much popular and it still is popular first of all it was fast okay so if i ask you that will you use windows vista you'll say sir no i will not use windows vista why not because the first problem is that windows vista is slow it takes a lot of amount of time to start your computer but windows 10 is fast and so is windows 7 so both of these windows are actually fast they have a lot of functionalities okay the stability the scalability these are these are much more common in windows 7 then the security system the win is also very good and then after con uh, they also focused on let me go back to the slide in windows 7 they also focused on enhanced graphics card okay they focused on the security issues if though the security issues they started working on 2000 okay so from windows 2000 they started working on security and stability of the enterprise applications because as i said before many people were actually using windows for their home and for personal use or official use so it actually become a necessity to make sure that the computers were secure stable okay they had enough ram to actually if you want to listen to a music or even if you want to play a game okay you need to have enough ram enough hard disk and also the cd rom okay so from around 2000 uh, nine, windows 95 the cd rom was first introduced if you remember C cd was still popular in bangladesh as well we used cd for two different purpose the first one to actually install any software or transfer any software so before you know the internet actually became so popular the torrent and all other websites came the only way you could actually play any games or any softwares okay by having a cd so what we used to do we used to actually buy cd from the <coughs> from the different shops and then for games for softwares even for music you know people who used to listen to music they had to buy cd or dvd and then we used to, even for movies okay whenever you needed a, mo a new movie came you you went to the shops and used to buy movie disc movie dvd and they had around different level of prices but what actually changed now is that from windows xp we started gradually using usb flash storage and also wi-fi networking so the internet started to become popular day by day and what the first change it made that when you had usb storage okay so usb is a pen drive okay so pen drive cd you can only use it for once okay so if you want to take one game and you write that in a cd okay so that means in that cd only that that game will be there unless that is a rewritable CD. So in most of the shops, they used to have a uh, non rewritable CD, which costed around five taka to 10 taka. And they used to sold, sell it around 30 taka. Okay, so that's a small profit margin. But what happened that when people actually had USB flash storage, they could actually transfer files, not from only computer to computer, even for personal use. So if one of your friend had a game, okay, what you could do, you could just copy that game from your computer to his computer or 
also the opposite if you wanted to watch a movie what do we do now we just actually use pen drive okay even nowadays what happens we actually don't even use pen drive as well because everyone have not everyone but most of the people have very access to the internet and they just watch it from internet directly so if i draw a timeline initially it started with cd to transfer data okay and from cd we actually moved on to the usb flash storage and as the internet connection becomes popular from usb storage now we directly down download it from different internet sources utorrent and also ftp server okay if you see if you take internet connection from any uh, look isp provider they will also provide you with a ftp server link so from that ftp server you can download movies and series or series then dramas depends on what you want so different softwares even games okay so the data whatever that is whether that is a movie song is becoming more and more popular and more and more accessible okay now what role the operating system plays in it operating system actually plays a major role to facilitate this transformation operating system actually plays a major role so the ftp that you see or the usb storage all these have to communicate via operating system now after windows 7 is it the last windows no right after that we have windows 8 and windows 10 so windows 8 was also very popular even i used i used to use after windows 7 as long as soon as windows 8 came I installed Windows 8, okay, and then Windows 8.1, 8.2, different updates were there. But Microsoft, in a jump, moved on from Windows 8 to Windows 10. Okay, so still we actually don't use Windows 8 that much. Why? Because when Windows 8 first came, okay, well many people are still using Windows 7, so they are still in Windows 7, and those people who updated 8, they then updated to 10. So what happened there is only small number of people who use windows 8.1 and there's another reason is for that is that microsoft actually stopped providing updates and services from windows 8 now they only focus on windows 10 so what happened people who are actually using windows 7 okay so they actually use windows 7 or they have moved on to windows 10 but only a few number of people okay they are actually using windows 8 or 8.1 okay but both of the uh, windows are actually very good now, one thing we need to understand, okay, we, you cannot forget that in the last chapter, we have discussed what are the functionalities of operating systems. If you remember, there are seven to eight functionalities of operating system, it's starting from memory management, and then we have uh, <coughs> process management and so on. So operating system, okay, the chart that you see here, okay, in all of this operating system, okay, so in all of this, all those functions starting from job management process management and memory management they improved as well so here i am not mentioning them because they are obviously improving now this is the actually the history of operating system now we'll understand how the operating system architecture work so don't forget the change was not only in the graphical user interface but all about all the interfaces all the functionalities of the operating system the operating system actually became more and more advanced and at the same time more faster and more secure as well now understanding the operating system architecture and first of all we need to know what is an architecture so the architecture actually defines how an operating system works instead of what it can do so so far we have been studying that operating system can actually do this for us do that for us it can uh, allocate resources it can control other processes and so on but we have not been talking that how actually operating system does it and that's why we will this that's what we will discuss in the architecture so the features define that what it can do but those features must work on top of an operational methodology and this methodology is the architecture the current windows operating architecture is based on an original architecture in the windows nt OS that was first released in 1993. So the current Windows operating system is based on an original architecture that is Windows NT. And now we actually use a hybrid architecture. So what is a hybrid architecture? So this is basically like we when we combine features from different operating system to one. The, the layers now Windows operating system is divided into two layers. Okay. So first is called kernel mode 
where the operating system um, system kernel and other low level process operate and the user mode where the applications such as microsoft word or excel or environmental subsystem runs so when we say kernel if you remember the operating system of out of all the programs of operating system kernel was a program that actually runs all the time so we have two modes kernel mode and the user mode kernel mode where the operating system <coughs> kernel and other low level process operates now so this is the figure of layers in windows so as you can see in the user mode we have system support process service process user application environmental subsystems and subsystem dll S system support process directly communicate with the kernel mode service process and user application have to communicate with the kernel mode using subsystem dll and environmental subsystem subsystem they can also con uh, communicate directly with the kernel mode and in the kernel mode we have different executive processes windows and graphics functions we have kernel we have device drivers and we have hardware abstraction layer now only knowing the names are not enough we also have to understand what are the tasks of supports system support process or device drivers and so on now to understand the open architecture better first technically let's talk about the kernel first so technically kernel mode operations take place in something called ring zero of computer instruction set sys processors so what is sysc so there are two types of instruction set that we use in a computer one is called risc r i s c and another is called sysc c i c so what is sysc which as you can see complex instruction set computing and what is risc reduced instruction set computing so what is the difference between them we will discuss it in the later chapters but for now just know there are two types of instruction set that we use in our computers one is called risc another called sysc so in the kernel mode operations takes place in something called ring zero of sysc processor now most of the processor sysc processor used in computer system today and the common <coughs> architecture that we have are 32 bit and 62 bit and now we will see the word what does this 32 bit and 64 bit means so first of all let's start with a picture okay as you can see in this picture this is the 32 bit and this one is 64 bit so what is the first difference that you see even though the memory size is quite same the cache size is also same the registers are also same the communication between memory and the arithmetic logic unit here we have this line and here we have a much more wide line so that means the here there are some changes in the registers there are some changes in the memory and the, there's some ch changes in the communication path between 64 bit and 86 so first let's watch a video it will make it more clear computer hardware and software can come in 32 or 64 bit versions the difference between a 32 bit and a 64 bit is the way that it handles memory the bit size refers to the memory that it can address a 32 bit system can reference 2 to the 32nd power bytes of memory which equals to about 4 gigabytes however a 64 bit system can reference 2 to the 64th power bytes of memory which equals to about 16 exabytes which is 4 billion times more memory than a 32 bit now that number is so huge that it's virtually unlimited because we will never need to use that amount of memory so in a computer in order for data or a program to run it needs to be loaded into ram first so the data is stored on the slower hard drive and from the hard drive it's loaded into the faster ram and once it's loaded into ram the cpu can now access the data or run the program now in a 32-bit system since the maximum amount of memory that it can support is 4 gigabytes it may not be enough to hold all the data that the cpu needs to make the computer run as fast as possible and when this happens then some of the data has to be kept on the slower hard drive to compensate for the low memory so instead of data going from ram to the cpu 
it has to do extra work by going back to the slower hard drive. And when this happens, it slows down the computer. But in a 64-bit system, it's able to store a lot more memory than 4 gigabytes, which means that more data can be stored into the faster RAM than on a slower hard drive. And because it can store more data into RAM, the computer is able to run a lot faster. So in a nutshell, this is why a 64-bit system is faster than a 32-bit system. Okay, so you have seen the video. So basically in 32 and 64 bit, okay, here in 32 bit, we have four gigabytes of RAM. So the software that we have today, for some softwares, we actually need more RAM than more memory than that. Okay, and in that case, <coughs> what we do, if we have a 64 bit computing system, in that case, we can actually run the computer much more faster. So if we actually go through a difference between 32 bit and 64 bit, you can see that 32 bit is a type of CPU architecture that is capable of transferring 32 bits of data per clock cycle. 64 bit is a type of CPU architecture that is capable of transferring 64 bits of data per clock cycle. So that is the difference that you need to remember right now. Now if we go for some other differences, requires more time to process and response, requires a minimum time to process and response. Can address up to memory of 4 GB, can up to address memory of 16 exabytes, 32 bit is cheaper and 64 bit is expensive. 32 bit can be used as a personal computer to run home routine tasks. 64 bit can be used for personal computer, video editing, audio editing and other applications as well. Now, if some of you are actually work with <coughs> video uh, editing or any graphics related tasks, you will see that the having a 4 GB of RAM is actually not enough, especially whenever you are rendering, your computer actually becomes very slow and so on. So this is the basic difference between 32-bit and 64-bit architecture. Now, obviously, it seems that the 64-bit is of preferable, right? Because it's, uh, it can actually give you more speed, more memory and so on. But in general, in general, uh, still the Microsoft computers is still support a 32-bit Windows system. Why? We still support 32-bit because most of the softwares or basic softwares we have in our computer, they actually don't need that much of memory. It's most like some take some some of the softwares need 500 megabyte of RAM. Some softwares need 250 megabyte of RAM. Some need <coughs> 10 megabyte of RAM. So if you actually go to your task manager. And if you, whenever you, you run a software, you can actually check how much uh, RAM or process it, uh, how much network resource is actually taking. And you will see that in the most cases, we even don't even use four gigabytes of RAM for doing the basic task. Okay. So in that case, uh, the 64 bit actually unnecessary. So if you're just doing some basic task in your computer or whenever you are doing some basic task instead of doing something like video rendering or playing a games that is with high resolution. Most of the time we actually use, we do some basic tasks and in that case, 32 bit is enough. So that's why we actually still support 32 bits windows and operating system. Now let's go back to our slide. So here we first talked about the architecture of our operating system. Now, what happens in operating system, whenever a process or a program wants to do something, there are some level of permission that is given. So basically we can say that this is ring zero or the level one or level zero. This is ring one or the level one. This is ring two, the level two, and this is ring three, the level three. Now, what does this levels mean? That if you are in the ring three or the level three, if you want to do something, you need permission from level two. If you're in the level two, if you are a program that is permission of level two, if you want to do something, you need permission from level one. And if you're in level one, you need to permission from level zero. And the level zero, it doesn't need any permission. So, uh, it's not this one, this one is to simplify the way the ring works in six processors. If the ring three can do what the ring two process allow them to do. So if ring three want to do something and the process two doesn't give the permission, it will not be able to do it. Ring two processes can do what the ring one allow them to do and ring allow Ring one process can do whatever the ring zero process allow them to do. <clears throat> now in Windows, we only use two mode. Ring zero, that is privileged mode, and ring three, that is non-privileged mode. 
<coughs> so basically whenever you are in ring three if you want to do something you need permission from ring zero or i can say like this the ring one three the non-privileged mode can only do what the ring zero the privileged mode allows him to do so we have understood that what is a ring but let's see what does this actually mean so you see the we have seen that there are two layers of the operating system so in one layer we have this <coughs> user modes user mode applications or softwares like system support processors service processes user applications environmental subsystem and subsystem dll so all of this actually in ring 3 the user mode so if any of these applications or softwares want to do something it needs permission from kernel mode or i can say it needs permission from executives it needs permission from device drivers or hardware layer abstraction or kernel so that's how this operating system ring work so here again they have just discussed this topic user mode of operation takes place in the processor ring 3 also in non privileged mode the different rings of operation simply define the level of access granted to the processor so ring 0 also known as privileged mode or god mode in many games it's like a cheat code okay you can do whatever you want and in ring 3 is is basically simple functions operating system device drivers and graphics capabilities reside so basically whatever they allow you to do the operating system function you can only do it now what we need to remember from this so you first need to remember from this slide what is the what is computer architecture number one number two what is the 32-bit computing and 80 uh, 64-bit computing and then okay what is the difference between user mode and uh, privileged mode or non uh, god mode okay or kernel mode now there is another question here that is you see here for 64 bit we are using into 64 so we are representing 64 bit with into 64 but for 32 bit we are using into 86 so can anyone tell me why why not into 32 Yes, correct answer so basically even though it's a 32 bit okay this actually comes from a batch of processor name is 8086 okay so to represent or to actually show respect to that okay we use into 86 instead of into 32 because those 8086 processors they're actually an <coughs> old class of processors that we still use and if you want to know more just search why we use into 86 for 32 bit and you will get the details explanation so that's where we our slide uh, we are done up to slide 10 